Buenos dias. Good morning. Our speaker today is Dr. Jose Cruz Parada. He is an adjunct professor of missiology and intercultural ministries and is the doctor of ministries coordinator for, for the Spanish doctoral ministry uh, and the doctor of educational ministry. He is married to Betsy, who is the women's minister at Northwest Bible Church in Dallas. They are parents of Andres and Camila, and Camila is married to Elijah Cost. And Betsy and Camila are here today. Would you please wave so that we could honor you this morning? Thank you for being here today. Uh, Dr. Cruz received his bachelor's degree from the University of El Salvador in 1979. He received his THM from the Dallas Theological Seminary in 1986. He received his Doctor of Intercultural Studies from Fuller Theological Seminary in 2012 and his PhD in Northwest, from Northwest University in South Africa in 2021. So truly, we should be calling him Dr. Dr. Cruz. <laughs> Dr. Cruz has served as pastor in Central America as the coordinator for a nonprofit in Latin America with Partners International, as cross-cultural church planner in the Middle East, El Salvador, and the US, and is now involved in administration and teaching at DTS. Dr. Cruz loves to share with his students about the love of the triune God for the nations of the world. He also believes that prayer based on God's word is a delightful tool that God gave his church. He enjoys jogging, going on walks with his wife and dog Mourinho. The Cruz family live in Plano, Texas. Would you please help me welcome Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Sammy. Let us pray. Father, we come before you as needy people, and we ask your blessing on this time together as we open your word, that you will edify our lives, that you will comfort the discomforted ones, that you will bring uh, to our minds that there's a sin that we may depart from, and those who are in need of uh, an answer, may you give what everyone needs at this time. May you, Holy Spirit, have freedom among us, Lord, uh, and teach us. We ask all of this as we are at your feet this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. The graduation of 1986 was a special event, not only because Dr. John Walbert was retiring after 43 years of ministry as being the president of Dallas Seminary, but also because it was my graduation. That was special. <laughs> I remember his message. Who is Jesus Christ to you? That will determine your future, your life, and your ministry. Throughout my years, of life and ministry. I came to God when I was 18 years old. After that, as you heard years later, I came to Dallas Seminary. Then I went back home to pastor my home church in El Salvador. And then the Lord took us in different directions. But I've seen this. I've seen that what your understanding of Jesus is will determine your life and your future. I hope that for you, Jesus Christ is the center of your lives. And if, you, if that is the case, I would like to say that if Jesus is your center, or if we're striving for Jesus to become our center, as we always do, Dr. Uh, Howard Hendricks used to say that, that we're always going from one extreme to the next, and are always... And as we come through the middle, in that swing, we find that special biblical balance. But as we strive to make Jesus Christ our center, I should say, I would like to say that this is my suggestion for our lives. And the first thing of having Jesus as the center of our lives is the benefit that Jesus will shape our character and our devotion. So... 
having Jesus as our center will shape our character and devotion. Let me take you to the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 25, and then we'll read verses 36 and 37. Luke 2, verses 25, and then 36 and 37. And I read, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 36 and 37. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. We have two special characters here. The occasion is the dedication of Jesus being brought by Joseph and Mary to the temple. As they come to the temple, they encounter these two personalities. The first one is Simeon. And Simeon, the word says, is a man, a devout man, but also a righteous man, a man of character. And the term here for righteous is dikaio. It's the first or the same term used for Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, when, the doc, when Dr. Luke's, the same author of Luke 2, in Luke 1 says, and they were both righteous before God, referring to Elizabeth and to Zechariah, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They were following God. They were following Jesus. Jesus was central, and the values that they were trying to live out were the values of Jesus in practical life. But they were also devout people. Devout means to be focused, to be concentrated, to have one mindset, and that was Jesus. Over all things, over all priorities, Jesus was their number one. The term devout, Eusebes, is clearly seen in the life of this woman, Anna. Her name means grace. And Anna was a woman who had been a widow since she was very young. At that time, probably the age for marriage was 12 years old, as young as that. And she had been married for seven years. And then, we're not too sure, some commentaries say for 84 years, she was here at 84. Or others say, she, as ESV says, that she had been a widow for 84 years. That means she, she must have been, or 84 at least, and 103, in between that age. But she was a woman characterized by what it says here. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. My eyes were taken to this worshiping. She was dedicated to prayer. She was dedicated to fasting. But it was an act of worship. And the term there means service. She was offering the service to God. She was focused. She was concentrated. She had that in mind. She was a woman that was exercising her devoutness in that sense. And you may say, well, 60, 70 years of prayer and fasting without departing? And the other emphasis there is night and day? Because maybe to do it during the day is kind of easy, huh? but to do it during the nights as well. Can you imagine that faithfulness, that devoutness that this woman had? And the only reason or the only motivation I can give is the fact that this woman knew God. She had a relationship with the Lord. And we see in the following verse that she, in fact, was waiting, awaiting just like Simeon was awaiting the coming of Jesus. And that expectation that expectation found also in Simeon had brought her to that point of dedicating a life of worship in prayer and fasting. I believe this is one of the missing jewels and lost jewels in the church today. Devotion. 
the spiritual disciplines. And I was just so happy when I returned to Dallas Seminary to hear about spiritual formation now for two years. Because uh, I believe God has given us the platform or the conveyor or the pipeline of spiritual disciplines that we can know Him more. They're conveyors through which God's grace is manifested to us. Prayer is one of them. Fasting is another spiritual discipline. Scripture meditation is another one. I have the, the blessing, as uh, Natasha described, of being the coordinator, and we'll see the next slide, the coordinator for the Doctor in Ministry in Spanish program. And uh, this year, we had the privilege of uh, graduating this man by the name of uh, Ariel Martinez. He is a pastor in Honduras. He is the one that won the award, Emilio Antonio Nunez. For us, is the highest award that we offer every year. Not only because he is good in academics, he was excellent, but because of his character and devoutness. He is also the president of his own denomination with close to 500 churches in Honduras. His dissertation, I have the, the privilege also of revising dissertations, which is one of my favorite things to do, really. I've learned that from Dr. Barfoot. <laughs> and uh, he chose a topic about biblical meditation as a means of spiritual transformation in the image of Jesus Christ. And in this topic, choosing to meditate on God's Word in order to become transformed in the image of Christ, he took 20 of his pastors to walk alongside with them throughout several months in which they meditated on Scripture, memorized it, and then they evaluated what has the fruit been of that exposure to the person of Jesus. And there were three things, especially, that came out out of that dissertation. One was that the pastors confessed that they were more appreciative and in love with their wives. Being, having Jesus as the center made them love and express their love for the wives more. Amen, say the wives. <laughs> Number two there was a refreshing in their ministry. They gained perspective. Just like this woman, Anna, had fallen in love with Jesus, the pastors renewed, because it can become routine in ministry if you don't watch out. But the third thing, that they became stronger against sin, against temptations, especially in the area of sexual immorality. That's what... Jesus Christ, having him as center does in our lives. We're transformed by it. That's why the character is important. Character is formed, devotion as we devote ourselves to him. The second thing that I see in this passage is that when we have Christ as the center of our lives, we walk with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Let's go then to the following verses of Luke 2. Verse 25, part B, it says, He, Simeon, was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And, verse 27, He came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus... To do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. This is a very interesting aspect here. We're talking about inter-testament times. Old Testament has happened. New Testament has come. There's a silence from scripture about this time. 400 years gap. But all of a sudden, in the New Testament, here in the book of Luke and in the other Gospels, we see a jump coming out of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's work. It was the fulfillment, the coming, the preparation of Jesus 
physically into this world. In the fullness of time, says Galatians. And in the fullness of time, we see the Holy Spirit at work once again. The Holy Spirit in the life of John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit in the life of, of Mary, having conceived by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the life of Zechariah, as he receives this word from God and prophesies, filled with the Holy Spirit, according to Luke chapter 1, verses 67. And we see this man three times in this two and a half verses. There's a reference to the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not see death before he would see Jesus. And then the sensitivity, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Word of God in the New Testament says. Book of Galatians, in the book of Ephesians, full with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. And this is what God desires from us. Now, this was not a spur-of-the-moment thing. Simeon had been waiting for the coming of Jesus for decades, probably. We don't exactly know for how long. Because it says there, waiting for the consolation of Israel. He had been waiting. And that term doesn't mean he was sitting around. That term means he was excitedly, with emotion, with desire, that the presence of, the, of God, the consolation, which is the same word used for the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, here is the root paraklesis, the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. In difficult times, in times when there's confusion, disorientation, here's the Holy Spirit guiding his people. Can that be also our experience in today's world as we face so many situations internally and outwardly? Is the Holy Spirit still speaking to us as spoke to Simeon in this case with that in tune with God that he was able to go to the temple just in time to meet with Jesus and to hold them. Having the sensitivity to walk in the Spirit for the right time in the right place. Isn't that special? I don't want to fool myself. We live in this world with our nature. And I'm sure Simeon, just like you and I, fell into sin, to temptation, but there's always opportunity. There's always forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive our sins. He is just and faithful to forgive our sins and clean us from all iniquities. That's where God is. The last thing I want to say is that uh, this central aspect of Jesus in our lives will give us a message of hope, personally, and a message of hope to Jews and non-Jews. Having Jesus as the center of our lives will transform and will give us a message of hope, personally, and a message of hope to the world. Verses 29 through 32 Lord, now you are letting your servants depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Chuck Swindoll says in his commentary in the book of Luke that this passage was probably a song that Simeon had memorized. He knew that he was going to see, it had been revealed to him, it says, verse 26, that he was going to see Messiah, the Lord's Christ, the Anointed One. And he knew that before he died, he was going to see him. So he had been repeating these words to him and probably had memorized them as a song. And here, 
He divides it in two parts. One, a message of hope for himself. Lord, Lord, now you are letting your servants depart in peace according to your word. It's kind of scary, isn't it, to know that he already seen what God had promised him. He has seen Jesus. What was next? He was, it was time to go. <laughs> but you know what? We never know, do we? One of these students that you saw, he lost his wife last semester in a car accident. I got a little note in a nice envelope a couple of weeks ago, and I, I saw it, and I saw, thought, maybe this is an invitation for, of some sort. So I opened the envelope and started reading. And it says, Dear Jose, address to me with my home address. For over 40 years, Neptune Society has been recognized as the largest and most trusted cremation provider in the United States. <laughs> we provide simple cremation at an affordable price without any of the unnecessary services many people don't want. We want to make sure that we are reaching you. And they sure did. <laughs> so if you want to know more about the benefits of cremation, please complete the information below and we will deliver to you the latest version of our cremation answer book. Anyone interested? <laughs> to be honest, it took me my surprise. I, I started cracking up and I think my daughter was when I said, Camila, look what I just got. I mean, <laughs> is this a sign? Am I... Am I we don't know, do we? We don't know. Simeon kind of knew, but he was ready. God had given him peace because Christ was the center of his ministry in his life. And the last part, and the last quickly, because I'm over time now, is that there's a message for the world, too, that we will have when Christ is our center. Because it says there, Beautiful passage, incredible words, just in these two verses. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. You have prepared in the face of all peoples. This coming of this Messiah, of Jesus, is nothing hidden. It's out. It's no secret. It's being preached. It's being known. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. A light for us from where we get photo that reveals who we are, right? Our features, our hair or lack of hair, whatever. We see through the light and for the glory to your people, Israel. Gentiles and Israel, the ones that didn't have glory because they were in dishonor of rebellion. Now through Jesus, they have honor. Jesus is the center. He truly is. <laughs> The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is, he is all in all. He is the good shepherd, the door, the bread of life. He is the center of the universe, the preeminent one. And he deserves and wants to be our center. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you. For the blessing that we have to know you. And I, I am the first one to confess. We depart. We deviate from you. But you always bring us back. With your staff. With your words. With your continuous wooing in our lives. We thank you Lord for our Lord Jesus. For the beauty of his person. The kindness, the mercy, the sacrifice, the strength, the power as well over everything and anything. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we want to recognize him. And we want to come back to you if we are away. Bring our thoughts back. Bring our studies in. Our work, our ministries, whatever it is, without you have no meaning if you're not the center. We come back to you today, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. In the name of our Lord, amen and amen.